A short while ago, I visited a museum exhibit that had a small selection of objects from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Among them were some fantastic depictions of the pharaoh bow hunting from a chariot, as well as some exquisite examples of ancient Egyptian archery equipment. Despite their advanced age and decay, it was readily obvious that these objects were incredibly detailed and well-made. Weapons fit for a king. The tomb contained a huge inventory of treasure, more than could ever be reasonably brought along for a traveling museum exhibit. Nonetheless, I do think that the curators made some interesting and perhaps unusual choices for what to display. In particular, what really struck me was how short the pharaoh's arrows were. Some seemed around 22 or 23 inches long, but others were much, much shorter and could easily be mistaken for crossbow bolts. By contrast, depictions of Tutankhamun and other pharaohs clearly show the Egyptian monarchs drawing very long arrows, anchoring somewhere behind the ear. This was a common historical practice all across the world and all across time, whenever ample power was required. So what's going on with these very short arrows? Well, a quick review of the inventory of Tutankhamun's tomb shows that the majority of his arrows were actually very long, with many sets having an average length of well over 30 inches. The shorter arrows are documented as well, but they are far fewer in number. Perhaps the curators chose to exhibit the more atypical arrows for understandably practical reasons. Being smaller, they are likely easier to transport, and also easier to arrange and show in a display case. As for why King Tut had such a wide spectrum of arrow lengths, it's hard to say for sure. Conceivably, he could have shot the extremely short arrows from some kind of overdraw device. But as far as I know, these had not yet been invented. Perhaps the most logical explanation is that the shorter arrows were simply left over from when Tut was a child. His draw length would have increased progressively as he grew older. The 34 and 35 inch long arrows that make up most of the collection would have been quite fitting for the 5 foot 11 inch tall pharaoh. I was a little disappointed that the museum did not manage to obtain the highly unusual split limb bow that was found in the tomb. Whether this was a one-off novelty that only a pharaoh could afford, or a more widespread idea, is hard to say. Finally, getting to see up close the artwork of the pharaoh shooting his bows made me notice something interesting. In all of the examples, Tutankhamun is shown wearing what is clearly an arm guard, ostensibly to protect his left wrist from the slap of the bowstring. The tomb inventory does list some objects as being arm guards, and photographs of them from the archives do look like they could be reasonably construed as such. Apart from King Tut, artistic representations of ancient Egyptian arm guards are, to the best of my knowledge, exceptionally rare. This raises the interesting question of how common and how necessary arm guards actually were for most ancient Egyptian archers. The portrayals of Egyptian draw hands, including that of King Tut, are most consistent with either a thumb draw or a pinch draw. Neither of these releases is commonly associated with the need for an arm guard. For skilled archers using a thumb draw, the string does not travel close to the forearm. Yet, it's not completely impossible for wrist slap to happen. Regardless of his exact shooting method, which we will likely never know, it seems King Tut was prone to string slap, and this idiosyncrasy in his technique was reflected in his royal artwork. There's really no substitute for getting to see original Egyptian artifacts up close. A sense of scale and detail is something that is hard to communicate in a photograph or video. And even if you can't touch the artifacts, getting to see them in person can nonetheless help one feel a visceral connection to these archers of the past. <laughs>